Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk from Jerusalem, Israel. Today, the 13th day of the month of ER 5777. It is Tuesday, May 9th. 2017. It is the 28th day of the Omer Malchut Shebenetzach and the conclusion of the Sphira, the emanation of Netzach this week, Parshat Emor. Rabbi Chaim Richman here with me in the studio, my best friend and yours, Yitzchak Ruvain, and spiritual implications, dimensions, and and uh, power of the days that we're in is just so overwhelming. This month of ER is so so totally um i don't know the experience of it is amazing you know with the with the the um memorial day and independence day and the days of the sphera and the whole concept of of the bridge between passover and shavuot and this coming Sunday is Lagba Omer, which is a very significant day, the 33rd day of the Omer, the anniversary of the passing of the, of the great Rabbi Shem of Yochai, they, when so many of Israel come together in unity. But before that, of course, tomorrow, tonight, here in the land of Israel and all over the world, the 14th day of the month of Iyar Pesach Sheni, oh, the second yeah. Passover, a, an unsung biblical holiday of of, um, of biblical proportions, of bigger than big, b- bigger than life proportions. So there's so much going on, and first and foremost, I think so much of what we are what we are going through this month is all about the um, attribute of appreciation, of appreciating Hashem in our lives, of appreciating our relationship with God everything that he does for us. I mean, that's what the whole month of ER is really all about. That's what these incredible holidays that we've been blessed with in in modern times. Independence Day, Jerusalem Day, which is actually two weeks from tomorrow, the day of the unification of Jerusalem in in the 67 war, 50 years. This is the Jubilee of Jerusalem. Everything here is based on the concept of, thank you, Thank you, God. Who can say it? Are we able to even say that? So many people today are in absolute denial. Everything is about them. Everything circles around them. But but living for Hashem means we realize that everything is about Him. And you know what? Er, we said, is the letters Aleph Yud Yud Rish, which is an allusion to the verse in uh, Parshat B'Shalach, the Book of Exodus, that says, "I, the Lord, will heal you." I'm your healer. That's what the month of ER is all about. We spoke about that, the idea that the manna from heaven began falling during this month, and that's associated with the concept of healing. But you know what? I realized also that this month is the is like the um, it's like the whole theme of this month is the rebirth of the state of Israel, and plugging that into the the biblical context. And honestly, that is like the healing of the whole world. There you go. Yes, the establishment of the State of Israel and all of its promise and its potential and what it will bring about in this world is in itself the healing of the month of ER. But, you know, this week's Torah portion that we're going to be reading, Emor, which is so amazing, it begins with uh, some laws of the Kohanim and um, begins, first of all, with the concept of the Kohanim not becoming... Uh, contaminated to death and that whole deep Torah idea of what death represents and why the Kohanim who are the conduits of bringing Hashem's blessing into the world through the Holy Temple must not uh, subject themselves to the debilitating illusion of death Um, and some laws about the Kohanim that are uh, quite frankly difficult for us to understand in our generations when we're so removed from what the idea of being in the Holy Temple is all about. And then we have chapter 23 of Parshat Amor, which is one of the most amazing Torah readings because it's all about the cycle of the year, of the rendezvous of time, of the festivals. And in fact, the, the, the um, Torah-based commandment that we are so involved with over these seven weeks of the content of the Omer is found in this week's Torah portion, which is so amazing, the counting of the Omer. And at the end of the Parsha, of course, we have the appearance of the mysterious blasphemer, which maybe we'll talk about a little bit later, who is all about 
not, not appreciating Hashem in this world at all. I think that's what his blasphemy was all about. Anyway, I want to say just a word uh, about the counting of the Omer as a midway, it's not even midway, um, review of what, what it is that we've been doing. Um, tonight we are actually, today we are actually, we have actually completed the first uh, four weeks of the Omer. And just a reminder for some of our listeners who might be tuning in now, what is the Omer all about? O-M-E-R is, of course, transliteration of Ayin Vav Mem Reish. The Omer is actually a biblical measurement, dry measure, and in this case, it's a measurement of barley that was actually brought as an offering in the Holy Temple at the conclusion of the first day of Passover. And coinciding with this offering of, of barley that was brought to the Holy Temple, there is a commandment that we read about here in this week's Torah portion in chapter 23 of the book of Leviticus. Commandment, God commands Israel to count every day the days and the weeks between Passover and Shavuot, seven complete weeks. It's actually a, a mitzvah to count each day. And this is a mitzvah that's associated actually with a, with a tremendous um, joyful anticipation because we're counting the days with great enthusiasm towards the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, much like a person who's looking forward to a happy occasion, a birthday. In this case, it happens to be a wedding, because it is actually, that's the best way to describe God's giving of the Torah to the people of Israel at Mount Sinai on Shavuot. But the idea is, these days of the counting of the Omer, these seven weeks, are days of tremendous spiritual emanation. And in fact, every single day, conveys a particular spiritual emanation and broadcasts and resonates a particular sp a spiritual emanation which according to our holy sages the idea is that it is corresponding to a divine attribute but these are emotive attributes not intellectual attributes they correspond to the realms of human endeavor that are that are guided by and determined by our emotions which Torah teaches us we are actually to be in charge of and not to be led by. Uh, our emotions are extremely important, but we need to um, learn how to use them to our advantage and for serving Hashem. So the tradition of the counting of the Omer in, in this light, in terms of, of the spiritual ascent that is associated with the counting of the days as we, as we progress towards Shavuot, it's about trying to address issues within our personality that may on some level be preventing us from reaching our full potential. And according to tradition, these issues correspond to particular levels of spiritual growth. And all of this, of course, on the background of the fact that when the children of Israel left Egypt on the, the first night of Passover, they were, they were in a state of um, expanded consciousness that night, that Hashem took them out as a gift outright but it was not deserved because they hadn't done any work yet to, to progress spiritually. So the idea of the days of the counting of the Omer is basically counting back to where we were on the first night of Passover, but making it more of a solid, lasting acquisition on a soul level because it's associated with work that we're actually doing. And these are days of holiness, and that's why this commandment is found in this chapter of Leviticus 23 in, in our Torah portion this week, in the same chapter that enumerates all of Israel's festivals, because these are days truly of joy, albeit it's a hidden potential joy because it's commensurate to the revelation of our potential. And of course, later in history, these days had superimposed on them a degree of sadness because mm -hmm. of historical events that were associated with this time. In any event, the, the bottom line is that during this period of time, our forefathers exited Egypt and they prepared themselves spiritually to receive the Torah. And they were absolutely like newborns. They just were rescued from the clutches of evil, the constriction of Egypt. Of Egypt. And this, this process that they went through over these seven weeks required a tremendous amount of intense preparation and self-examination. They had just been slaves to Pharaoh, and now they're about to become servants of the one God. How do you do that exactly? How do you make the switch? It's actually a challenge that each one of us are faced with every day of our lives, because we all have the little Pharaonic thing within us. We all have the little, the little, uh, little, um, 
you know, um, slave driver that keeps us that keeps us uh, in check, that keeps us prisoner. And oh, that's what these days are all about: to accounting the Omer and reflecting on the call to personal growth, which beckons us during these days to help us try to become better people, try to become pure, as the sages teach. Try to become human beings. Sages teach a person who comes forward and expresses the desire to become pure, that person receives heavenly aid to do so. So, so this is about actively seeking purity. And, and these days are like so exciting. It's not like, oh boy, another thing I gotta do. I'm so exhausted, but I gotta remember to stand up and count and say the blessing and count. You sanctify us the commands, commanded us to count concerning the Omer. Today is da 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 week. No, that's not how we do it. We do it with tremendous vim and vigor because these days are seriously, incredibly exciting and we realize they are a gift for our benefit that God is enabling us with an opportunity to really, really look at ourselves hard. What are we going to do with our lives? And you know what? The great Hasidic masters teach the entire year is hanging in the balance of these days. And just as crops are growing during these days, so too a person's life force, which is, by the way, what the sphere of Netzach that we've been dealing with mm-hmm. until now is all about. The, just like crops are hanging in the balance during this particular season, so too our life is being revealed now. Right? I think it's more than just our year that we're determining during these... I think it's everything. It's all time. During these 49 days, we're just recalibrating everything from the, from the get-go, from the first day to, to the last. This is, uh, you know, this is our chance for input. But we're changing ourselves, hopefully. We're refining ourselves. And by refining ourselves, we're refining the universe. We're refining creation. Especially yes. if you subscribe to the, to the holographic universe theory. Yes. Which is, Yitzhak and I are doing some serious research into, we're not yet convinced doing that the universe is it. not a hologram. Because it's possible that all of reality, as, as it is perceived today, is but a figment of Hashem's dream. And we're somewhere in that dream. We're in there. Who was it that said? I'll let you be in my dream if I can be in yours. Exactly. Some Nobel Prize winner for literature. Yeah. I'll let you be in your my dream if you'll let me be in yours. Absolutely. So, that's what God's that's exactly what God says exactly. to us. That's what the Torah's all about. And this I think that I can entrance. understand the more I study quantum physics in my spare time. <laughs> I'm, you know, working towards a degree in holo- holographic universe studies, and the more I understand the University theory, of, of, of scientific, <laughs> scientific community is definitely um, warming up to um, to the fact that there's a, an intelligent design and a god, and the holographic universe, as far as I can understand it, is basically um, substantiating the principles of Kabbalistic thought as far as how Hashem runs the universe. But I digress. Sounds like a, a video parsha. The with all these digressions, Rabbi. In any event, you, I think you wanted to remind everybody at home, Yitzchak, to check the Temple Institute Facebook page for our one minute, it's generally 49 seconds to one minute and seven seconds, short video every day during the days of the content of the Omer. Here's Yitzchak to tell you all about it. Uh, the Rabbi, with love and dedication and lots of fervent imagination presents each day, like he said, between 49 seconds, significant number, to a minute and seven seconds. Sometimes uh, I go over time. A, a description, a revelation a of, the, of the, of the uh, day's uh, actual spheric, spherotic uh, But I'm trying to do reckoning. there, I'm trying to actually bring the very lofty teaching of the sages, I'm trying to, in a minute or less, I'm trying to give a very specific practical application for every day, for what we could be focusing, because the teaching is, and the Holy Rabbi Nachman emphasized this, that these days are saturated, saturated with such spiritual power that, the, that everything about these days, even the ordinary conversations that are going on between people, they're actually a reflection, whether we know it or not, of the spiritual challenge of the particular 
the dynamic configuration of the sefira, the divine attributes emanation of that day. So it's just basically like we're trying to get well. It's er, ani Hashem rofecha, I Hashem will heal you, and this whole thing is about getting well and becoming the people that we can be, so that we can indeed receive the Torah at Mount Sinai and bring the light to mankind. Absolutely. Holographic light. It's real. It's very real. This week, tomorrow, in fact, tonight, Pesach Sheni, the second Passover. Talk about real. Got to be the most exciting and incredible concept in the Torah, right? It's, it's not in this week's Torah portion, it's fast-forwarding to Parshat Bahalotcha in the Book of Numbers, and it's in Chapter 9. So Chapter 9 of the Book of Numbers tells us, right, we're talking here about the second year from the exodus from the land of Egypt. The children of Israel made the Pesach offering there in the desert in that second year. They made the Pesach offering on its proper day, which is the 14th day of the first month, which is Nisan. But then, verse 6 tells us, there were men who had been contaminated by a human corpse and could not make the Pesach offering on that day because, after all, the rules pertaining to Tahara and Tuma are very important. They approached Moshe and, they, and Aaron on that day and they said, we are contaminated through a human corpse. Why should we be diminished by not offering Hashem's offering in its appointed time among the children of Israel. This question was so rad, is that the, how the kids call it? <laughs> so totally outlandish, so, so totally unprecedented. Because here we have the Torah, which is, which is unfolding for this generation. The mitzvot are being taught to them. And they had this idea, these men, they had been either the ones that had been dealing with the the corpses of Nadav and Avihu, mm -hmm. who we learned about last week, the children of Aaron, or perhaps they were the ones that were actually assigned to be carrying Yosef's coffin. Mm -hmm. In any event, through no fault of their own, they were rendered ritually impure, if you'll pardon the expression, Tame, off, off kilter, misaligned spiritually because of their exposure to death. And Sink. such a person is, is not eligible to bring the Passover offering. So why was this so rad, so totally unprecedented, so bizarre? Because nowhere until now had there been any indication in anything that they had learned or been taught that if a mitzvah, if the shelf life of a mitzvah has has expired, that it could be done. You know, there, are, there are some mitzvot that are eternal, that are forever. And then there are some that are eternal and forever, but they have to be done within a certain framework, a certain period of time. And that's how the, the mitzvah of Passover is. The Passover lamb has to be slaughtered on the 14th day of Nisan, and it has to be eaten that night, because that is what the Passover is all about. Everything about it from beginning to end. And we know that the Passover offering, in whose light we are still basking, all this month of Iyar, because the month of Iyar is like a bridge between Nisan and Sivan. It's like one long Chol intermediary days of the festival of Passover. Of course, we didn't bring the Passover offering this year, but we tried, and we're into it. And the point is we understand how important it is because it represents Israel's task in this world of rising above and slaughtering idolatry and making a statement about the one God of Israel. So these people said, we want to do that too. But true, we couldn't do it in, on time. And Moshe, instead of like giving them the back of his hand or throwing them down the stairs or saying, that's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard, they come and they say, you know, well, we weren't around on time. It's a month later. Can we do it now? And Moshe said to them, stand by, verse 8, chapter 9 of the book of Numbers, and I will hear what Hashem will command you. Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the children of Israel saying, if any man will become contaminated through a human corpse, so we'll be on a distant road, whether you or your generations, in other words, this is for all time, he shall make the Pesach offering for Hashem. In the second month, on the 14th day in the afternoon, shall they make it with matzot and bitter herbs, shall they eat it. And then he goes through the rest of the laws here regarding it. And this is an eternal decree. So, whoa. So what happened here, totally and absolutely unprecedented, is that this group of men from amongst the children of Israel, they changed the facts on the ground. They established an eternal covenant. They established a law. They clarified a mitzvah and the dynamic of how it can be observed in a different way for all time because they 
wanted a second chance. And because they had the kind of moxie to like say, like, wait, could we also do this? Moshe didn't know what to answer them, and Hashem mm -hmm. said, they are correct. So this is so amazing for so many reasons, and mostly because of what the day represents, which we'll talk about. But I'm not even up to that yet, the power of the day and what happened on that day in history and what it means for the Jewish people and why I think it's in the month of ER and what, and what the whole thing means. But, but I can't even get up to that yet because I'm so excited reading these verses and understanding Starting. that this happened this week, that this is about the day that begins tonight and that it's a message from Hashem for all time that in a way, when it comes to the most important things of all, it's never too late. And that you need to really step up to the plate because these men actually initiated, as it were, yeah. a change in the in the Torah itself. That Hashem Changing said, you know reality, what? Changing you know what? And the bizarre thing here is like Hashem is saying to Moshe, tell these people, you know what? That's a really good idea. I wished I'd thought of it. <laughs> Except and this is the most deepest thing in the world, open up your heart in the deepest way. What Hashem is really saying is I was waiting for you to say that. I'm so glad that you said that. I was just waiting for you to say that. So glad you asked the question. I happen to have the answer right here. <laughs> it's here in my bag. It's here so, in my hand. So, of course, the second Passover represents a lot of things. It represents the fact that we have a second chance. And you know what? The month of Iyar, the month of healing, the month of the establishment of the State of Israel, which follows the pattern of the fact that King Solomon oversaw the beginning of the construction of the first temple in this very month, and that Zerubbabel, when he came back from exile, began the construction of the first temple in this very month, Second and other temple. attempts were made to rebuild the temple in this very month. It's all about reestablishing the kingdom of Hashem and bringing the Shekinah into the world. That's what Pesach is all about, and so how perfect for there to be a second Passover in this month, but the implications are even greater when we, when we understand another dimension of the second Passover that I think we'll talk about when we come back for more. Sounds like a plan. Temple Talk. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Temple Talk. and welcome back to Temple Talk. Today is the 13th day of the month of ER 5777. It's the 9th of May, 2017. This is Yitzchak Ruvain with me, Rabbi Chaim Richman, speaking here from Jerusalem, representing the Temple Institute. And uh, this coming Shabbat is Parshat Emor, which we've been talking about. And as, uh, let me see, today is the 28th day of the counting of the Omer, as we have been talking about quite fervently with a lot of uh, excitement and exhilaration. We've been talking about Pesach Sheni, second Passover, which begins tonight. It's a one-day holiday, which we've been talking about. And Rabbi, you know, the whole, it's so appropriate that it comes in the middle of the, of the counting of the Omer, because the counting of the Omer it's sort of like it's it's opening up a window of it's it's fluid you know it's it's a time of constant change and growth and what a perfect time to introduce this whole concept of of second chance and a second chance is what allows us to to grow uh, and it's just i mean it's phenomenal that there were people who who said wait a minute you know like they found themselves like on the outside of, of, of existence. Like, what, what, what's going on here? We were supposed to do this Passover offering, and, and we couldn't. 
and you know, like Wilma, let me in, you know, that kind of so thing. They refused to be marginalized, right? And, and you know, they're like banging on the they door, were like banging on Shem's world on the, and, the doors and, of the Holocaust. And God says, uh, to, to quote Paul McCartney, open the door, let him in. Whoa, but another concept, Rabbi, another concept is that when people sincerely beckon you know, Torah to Hashem and say, we want in, we don't, we don't want to be in the outside, we want to be in the in. And then another human being, as in Moshe, you know, has the ability to listen and say, whoa, God's there. God will answer you. You know, if, if human beings can listen to one another in, in such a moment of intense, uh, intimate sincerity, then God's going to be there and he'll answer. I mean, I think that's another beautiful aspect of this. And this, like you said, the whole Sfirat Omer is basically giving a person a chance to do it. And again, Medinat Yisrael, Yom Ha'atzmut, the Independence Day, whole deal of establishing the State of Israel is basically the second time. Like, and you know what? The Prophet says, like, Shainit la'enei kolchai, like Hashem is going to bring about the redemption, the second second redemption before the eyes of the whole world. And, and the Prophet who says that the miracles of... The future redemption are going to dwarf and obscure the miracles of the going out of Egypt. It's all about like the second time. Now here's the thing. The deeper level of the second Passover is that there's a tradition that the war with Amalek mm -hmm. that we read about at the conclusion of Parshat B'Shalach in the book of Exodus chapter 17 when Amalek came and battled in Refidim Moshe said to Joshua, choose people for us and go and do battle with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. This whole thing here. So the tradition is that Amalek attacked the children of Israel on the second Passover. Mm -hmm. That was the day. The year before. Yes. On that day, though, on, right. the, on, the, 15, on the 14th of, of Eir. What does that represent exactly? What is the teaching there? What are we what are we being told by that by that tradition, whether it's a metaphor or whether it's exact? The idea is everything that a Malik represents, which we talk about so much in Adar around the time of Purim, whole concept of Amalek, Ayin Mem Lamid Kuf, which is a spirit, not just a people. It is the gematria, the numerical equivalent of safik, which means doubt. And there's this idea that Amalek is about taking away a person's conf confidence and conviction in themselves and in their ability to do the right thing and to change and to become a better person. Amalek is all about doubt. And Amalek is, a, is also um, a voice of doubt within a person that can be very crippling that can say to a person, you know what, you'll never, you'll never make it. You'll never be good. You'll never be able to fix what you need to fix. And the deep, deepest teachings about Amalek are that that's really all that their goal is. Not to kill a person, just to render a person completely helpless and useless by, by basically like delivering that dead. message. Like, you know what, you, there's no way that you can fix anything, that you can, that you can change. You're a loser. You know, as opposed to the person who said, I can change, I swear. Another. <laughs> anyway. Say that again, Rabbi. I right. Can. So the Say thing is, what is the significance of, of our sages teaching us that that battle with Amalek, where they attacked Israel from behind, as we read about in the book of Deuteronomy, mm -hmm. right? That it took place on this day? And basically, they're basically trying to undermine, trying to uh, obliterate, trying to, trying to um, cancel out um, the hope of second chances. They're trying to say, that spirit, Amalek is trying to say to a person, no, you have no second chance. You can't fix it. It's, it's, it's useless. All hope is gone. And that's what Amalek is really all about, and the second Passover is really all about believing oneself and seeing that Hashem does believe in us, and that we have the ability to, to fix what we 
what we um, can fix. You're saying that's what the second Passover is about. Right. But that's really what the first Passover is about. It's, it's saying, you know, having com complete confidence in yourself because you're totally in touch with, with God there. You're doing what God says to do. And, you know, in Egypt, uh, what they did was, was mind-blowing because, because who could do such a thing, slaughter the lamb there? So it's the, it's the answer to Amalek. It precedes the, the, the trufa <laughs> precedes the, the makkah, the medicine right. precedes the, the illness because uh, they had it in them to, to show that they had total confidence in, in, in our connection with, with God. And Amalek comes along and says, well, maybe you don't. Think about that. Maybe you don't. And tries to weaken us that way. I'd very much like to believe that we'll have the opportunity to bring the Passover offering really on the second Passover that we weren't able to bring on the first. Of course, interesting thing about the Passover, the second Passover, Pesach Sheni, is that it is not about the community. It's about the individual, mm -hmm. this small group and individual, individuals who weren't able to bring it the first time could bring it on the, the second time, but actually as we learned and as we tried to emphasize in the Mythbusters video about the, the Korban Pesach, yeah. if the entire community is ineligible because of Tuma to bring the Passover offering in its appointed time, they actually can go ahead and do it. On the first Pesach. On the first Passover, yeah. even in a state of, right. of Tuma. So by definition, then, second Passover is an individual. Yes. Because if it's the entire nation, then we go ahead and do it. But it is a very, very inspiring month, and, and like you say, it fits in so perfectly with the other themes of the month, with healing, with the concept of the spiritual aspirations of Sefirah to Omer, and everything that we're going through. And this week's Torah portion, I tried to mention in the, in the beginning of our broadcast, it to me resonates very much with the concept of thankfulness, which is really, again, on, on the biblical level, what this month is really all about. And uh, again, the whole chapter about the cycle of time and the festivals, it's so amazing because the way a lot of people uh, look at the cycle of the year and, well, first of all, the way a lot of people look at the whole uh, lifestyle of a Jew who believes in the commandments, a lot of people look at it as being very limiting, as being very... You know, they think it must be so stifling, you know, like you have all these responsibilities, you have all these laws, you have all, all of these obligations. When do you guys cool out a little bit? Like, when do you relax? Like, <laughs> you know, and of course, um, that's not the case because the idea is that the mitzvot are the secret of living life to the fullest. They are about connecting with who we are and what we can be. And... Um, as I mentioned once um, in, a, in a teaching, if you don't want to do it, come back when you want to. It's not about being forced to do something. It's about wanting to do something out of love and out of realizing that this is a vision of a rectified world. The thing is, when you look at the cycle of time, you know, a certain season comes, you know, Passover, Sukkot, Shavuot, we're in the month of ER now. It's like, wow, you guys are so time-oriented, <laughs> so like bound by, you know, the things that are, that are um, on the calendar. The truth is, this chapter of, chapter 23 of Parshat Amor, mm -hmm. I think, is one of the most profound spiritual programs th that can be imagined. And, and the very opposite of all of those feelings is what I feel and what comes to mind, the idea that basically Hashem, who is the, the creator, and who is looking for us in this world at every moment to find him in our lives, in ourselves, and to connect, which is absolutely mind-blowing and absolutely the most transcendent experience that a person can have is to really, really realize that there's a God in the world. And it's a very big game changer if you really can go with that feeling the rest of your life. But unfortunately, most of us kind of put it in hibernate mode and just push the button a couple times a day or whenever we feel like it's time for a little God in our lives, but that's not the way it's supposed to be. So the thing is, God created us, He wants us, He wants us to want Him, sounds like a love song, which it is. And the thing is, this cycle of time, the way the Chagim, the way the festivals come out, Shabbat and the Omer and all of the, the festivals, 
they are the most exquisite and intimate divine kiss and hug for a person to be able to get what is needed at that time of year to be able to plug into this vast, you know, port <laughs> as motherboard. I don't know how to, how to what metaphor would be fitting for our listeners, and to reconnect and 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 we are people. We are creations, creatures that are that are very very time oriented, because we are subject to the dimension of time, mm-hmm. and the Torah's vision of time is that it is something that can that can elevate us completely that it's it's sacred it's sanctified it's so unbelievable right mikadesh yisrael vahazmanim we make a blessing that hashem sanctifies time why is that how could time be sacred it's not even tangible it's not like a silver chalice what is time exactly that it could be sanctified what it is is it's part of hashem's world it's an element opportunity that, that actually it's alive. Time is alive. It's all a hologram anyway. And I, I get so excited when I read this verse. Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, Hashem's appointed festivals that you are to designate as holy convocations, these are my appointed festivals. And of course, the first thing that's described is Shabbat. For six days labor may be done. And the seventh day is a day of complete rest, a holy convocation. You know, Mikra'e Kodesh, Dabar al Israel, speak to the children of Israel, Amart Aleyim, say to them, Mo'adei Hashem, the appointed times of Hashem, Asher Tikru'u Otam, which you shall call, which you shall designate, Mikra'e Kodesh. So here it's translated as holy convocations. But that, those words, Mikra'e Kodesh, you know how it can be read? You know how it can be understood? This yeah. is so cool. Mm-hmm. They call out holiness. Mm-hmm. The days themselves call out holiness. So I think that this fits in very well with the beginning of the parsha, which is about the Kohanim and about how they are basically dealing with everything in their lives. Again, like we talked about last week, olam shana nefesh, like you have the aspect of life, you have the aspect of of time, you have the aspect of space. And, you know, the parsha continues with the menorah. The light of the menorah, you know, uh, you know, shining this light of this of the lifetime continuum into the world, the sh- and then the showbread, and then all of a sudden, the bla- this is very very deep and mystical. What I'm trying to say, mm-hmm. I hope you're following me. Okay. Then you have this blasphemer, the son of an Israelite woman who went out, and he was the son of an Egyptian man among the children of Israel. They fought in the camp. The son of the Israelite woman and an Israelite man. The son of the Israelite woman pronounced the name. Pronounced the name and blasphemed. What did he say exactly? Was it just that he used Hashem's name in vain? So they brought him to Moshe and they find he had to place, be placed under guard to clarify themselves through Hashem. What had to be the second clarification that had to take place? Oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking about Balotcha. I thought it was mm-hmm. not the same parsha because in Balotcha that it was the clarification of Pesach Sheni. Yeah, but here, right. yeah, the clarification, what do we do with this fellow? And Hashem spoke to Moshe and said he had to be killed. Remove him, he has to be killed, right? So there's this amazing tradition that even the art scroll had the sensitivity to sight. <laughs> I, guess it, I guess it did not interfere with their agenda, this <laughs> particular page. Oh, did I say too much? And um, brings down the Midrash that Rav Barachia taught that the son of the Israelite woman went about in the camp scoffing about the showbread. Mm-hmm. Of all things, right? Because and and of course that's deduced by Rav Baruch here because of the fact that the 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 incident of the blasphemer comes right after the it's commandment, right. which is the first time that it's being told. And you know, right. in in the in Shmot in Parshat Truma, yeah. we and in Tzavah, kind of we had there we had there the mitzvah of the of the table, right? But not the commandment to place the bread. So now right. we first are encountering the commandment to actually bake these breads. So this is the first time, ostensibly, that it's being given over publicly, that we have to have these breads that are going to be hot on the table all week long. So Rabbi taught that he, that, 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 this, that this was the blasphemy, that he was saying, oh, a king normally eats warm, freshly baked bread. 
Why should God have old, cold bread in the tabernacle? And an Israelite rebuked him for saying that. One thing and the two to came the to blows, whereupon the son of the Israelite woman uttered the curse. So the subject of the blasphemy began with his doubt that this would actually happen, that this could actually be, that the bread would be hot. And, that, and he's saying, that's how you're going to honor Hashem, with a bunch of old, moldy loaves of bread? And as we know, one of the ideas about the showbread that we are taught is that it stayed hot all week long. I think this is so deep. I think this is absolutely amazing. This is, this is not a minor incident. This is not anecdotal. This is not just a metaphor. Because, yes, the showbread is a metaphor. And what is a metaphor for? The metaphor fact that these for? breads stayed hot all week long in the sanctuary. What is, it? what is that a metaphor for? Is that Hashem loves this world exactly as it is. That He places His blessing in this world. What you see, take a look around you. Believe it or not, this is it. This is as good as it gets because Hashem loves this world and this is the place that He wants us to fill with His presence. That's the main teaching of the Torah, the Jewish experience, that this is the world that counts, no other world. So he was going around, this guy, saying, like, that can't be. What he was really saying was, like, this, this whole program isn't going to work. It's a sham. This whole, this whole idea of the possibility of sanctifying this world and living for Hashem in this world and being focused on God consciousness and being able to live the way we're being commanded, it's not going to work. It, it's not going to stay hot all week. I think this is what he was really saying. Mm -hmm. He was really saying God doesn't care enough about this world. And that was the blasphemy. And you know what else I think? The real lesson here is, and which fits in exactly with everything that we've been talking about this entire broadcast, is that it was a problem in... Hakarat Tov, in appreciation, in, in everything that ear is all about, in thankfulness, in understanding how much Hashem loves us, how much compassion He has. And that's what the problem really was here. He was like not allowing God in. He was not allowing Him to, to, to be who He is. He was saying, and it was, it's very Amaliki, by the way, mm -hmm. what this, exactly, yeah. if, this is, if this is true, what the Midrash is saying on this level, what he was doing fits in exactly with Pesach Sheni, because he's, he's basically saying, no, none of this is, 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 gonna, is going to settle my existential angst. Mm -hmm. this is, you guys are all just living in some kind of a, of a dream, but the real universe isn't like that. And little did he know that the real universe is the holographic universe of Hashem's supernal will. And that's the only true reality. Ein od milvado, as we say here in Israel, means there is nothing else but Hashem. There is no other reality but God Himself. Everything else withers. Everything else is just an illusion. The only thing that is real is Hashem Himself. Well, there you go. There's our Pesach Shini teaching for 5777. Um, think about that and take that home with you. And by the way, if you would like to observe Pesach Shini, even without a Korban Pesach, if you can't bring a Korban Pesach, the offering, you can have matzah because that's part of the observance of uh, Pesach Sheni. Having a piece of matzah on Pesach Sheni is the least you can do. The most important thing <laughs> I think every, every listener has to do on the second day of Passover is say to Hashem, Hashem, let me have my second chance. I'm here, I'm ready, I'll believe in myself because you believe in me, and I am willing to try again and again. I will not throw the towel in, and I appreciate your giving me a place to start all over again. And no matter how many times I have to start all over again, the message of Pesach Sheni is, I will start all over again, again. And uh, tonight, Pesach Sheni actually is the beginning in the counting of the Omer of the Sphira of Hod, correct? Correct. Which uh, has an aspect of thankfulness and, and recognition. It does, and we teach about that through. Uh, we will be teaching about that throughout this week, hopefully. That hod, which is defined as humility, but also has a connotation of splendor, is because true humility is splendor. And because you, if you really exactly hod is lahodot to, to recognize, to acknowledge, to thank Hashem, which it takes a real humility to be able to do that and say it's not about me; it's about Hashem. That's what the sphere of hod is and all about. If it's not about us, 
then our own selves, our own ego, is not eclipsing the splendor, which is all around us and out there for us to see and to appreciate and to take in and to make the best of with our lives, to do the best that we can. It's beautiful stuff, Rabbi. I think you nailed it. It's you know what? Actually. This month is honestly so exciting and Every month is, and we always say this is the most important day of the year. We really do, and it's really true because if you're living for Hashem and realizing the beautiful resonance that He is broadcasting to us every day, every challenge, every possibility of becoming who we can become, what a what a blessing, what a privilege it is just to be alive. And the most important day of the year is right here, right now. This is it, this moment. Thank you for being with us this day, this moment, this place in God's world. Temple Talk.